Joining us now, Allison Lote. She is executive director of Samara, an organization devoted to studying citizen engagement with Canadian democracy. And as I welcome you here, let's get the story. Samara comes from what? Uh, Samara is the winged seed that falls from a maple tree, that little helicopter seed that you come see coming down in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we chose it because it's obviously a very Canadian image without being overtly like the maple leaf. And it suggests that from little things, from small seeds, hopefully bigger ideas grow. Because I have read your foundation stuff, but I never knew that's where yeah. it came from. Yes. So, okay, good to know. Okay, Allison, you've just completed a series of exit interviews mm -hmm. with 65 former members of Parliament. Yeah. And that's, I guess, exit interviews is fairly standard procedure in the private sector, but I haven't heard of it done with members of Parliament before. So how come you did it? Yeah, well, when we, we came to this originally with a real interest in politics and public policy and a belief that that's important to how we live together. Um, and when we started to think about well, how do we want to come at that, we thought, well, it would be fascinating to talk to people who are at that front line between citizens and their government, the members of Parliament. Um, and we had learned soon after that that exit interviews, which as you said, are common in lots of organizations, I think public sector organizations do them as well as private, um, they had never ever been done before in arguably one of the most important workplaces in our country, which is our parliament. Hmm. So we thought it would be a great way just to kick off what we hope will be a larger discussion about how our government works, how our politics works, and hopefully how we can improve it. Now I gather you're rolling out different bits uh, as That's we go right. forward here. So the first stuff that you've rolled out so yeah. far is recollections of politicians as to how they got into this game in the first place. Exactly. Uh, you wanted to ask that why? What was important to find out regarding that? Yeah, well, when we, um, when we approached the MPs, there were four things we said we would talk to them about, which we did. And the first is their motivations, um, and then also how they viewed the job and what they thought about when all was said and done. Um, and we originally wanted to ask them about their motivations because we wanted to just get them comfortable with the interview. Uh, and then, frankly, what we learned from that process was so fascinating, we decided it actually was worthy of, of some discussion on its own. So we, hence, we've produced this report, which we've called The Accidental Citizen, that tries to capture at least some of their motivations and path to politics. And their, how they got in, I, I guess, well, let's, let's follow up on that right now sure. since you called it Accidental Citizens. Uh, this from the um, Samara Foundation report. The central finding and the one that frames this report is how accidentally these MPs indicated they came to politics in Canada. This is not what we expected and was revealed in several ways. First, parliamentarians' backgrounds, experiences, pre-political careers, and expressed motivations for running were far more varied and much less predictable than we'd assumed. Mm -hmm. Most spent a generation pursuing other careers and interests before becoming a member of parliament. Further, these MPs did not consider themselves to be political insiders, even though they were generally highly involved in their communities. Rather, most portrayed themselves as outsiders and indicated they came to the job with that mindset. So, I mean, the obvious question to come out of that is, if they thought of themselves as outsiders, how do they end up getting involved in what is clearly one of the most inside games in the country? Well, that's exactly the question we asked ourselves. We were very surprised. We would have thought um, that people who I think a lot of Canadians would view as consummate insiders didn't come to the job with that outlook at all. Um, so when we actually, uh, I should mention, they didn't expressly say they were outsiders, but they talked, when we ta asked them about their motivations, they talked at length. Um, about how they viewed themselves for some reason as outside the political mainstream and that was a big motivation for why they decided to enter in the first place. Had a number of elements depending on the person. Sometimes it was one of a frankly individual identity. So women clearly uh, recognized that politicians are not often women uh, and that was a big motivation. Um, some who came from immigrant families, either immigrants themselves or the children of immigrants talked about that as one of their motivations. Um, sometimes it was a matter of perspective. They, they felt they had a view on an issue or on a, a particular uh, event of the day, such as the Quebec referendum was a big one, that mm -hmm. they thought needed more expression. Um, and other times it was m matters of education or class. Uh, people who came from you know, less white, you know, blue collar professions, as we traditionally say, who didn't feel that Parliament necessarily represented that view as well as it could. So it had a bunch of different elements, but you know, the collective narrative was one of really sort of standing outside and looking in, and which goes, surprised us. It sounds like it goes against the conventional wisdom, which I suspect much of the population holds, which is that from the second these people are born, they're thinking about their first yeah. campaign. Yeah. That's not true. That's not how they described it at all. Hmm. Um, the average age at which they entered was 47. Um, and so it, it's true to a degree that they had spent a generation doing other things. Um, but what I guess struck us most powerfully is how many of them said, um, you know, I had never occurred to me until I was asked. Uh, or, you know, I might have thought about it a bit, but I never planned for it. I never set my life up that way. And it wasn't until I was asked that I entered. So on one hand, we thought, you know, that's probably quite healthy, right? Um, you know, our politics is you know, responsive to a lot of different people. You don't have to plan your whole life around it. Um, but on the other, and I guess more profoundly, we wondered, 
you know, our, to ourselves, is that true that, you know, you really had never thought about it before? Or is it something deeper that we actually have a political culture in which it's uncouth or even maybe embarrassing to admit ambition in public life? Hmm. I'm going to follow up on that yeah. a bit in a second. But, uh, even though they haven't thought about it, perhaps, from the moment they entered right. the world, there are, and Jeffrey Simpson wrote about this in the Globe and Mail, there are people who've been there for an awfully long time. And here's what he wrote about that. He said, today's political landscape is dominated by lifers who got into politics rather early in their lives. Prime Minister Stephen Harper started his adult life as a ministerial aide, got elected to Parliament early as a Reform Party candidate, left the scene briefly, then returned. Jack Layton, who began as a Toronto alderman, has been a federal NDP MP and party leader for a long time. Bloc Québécois leader Gilles Duceppe entered politics, like other Bloc MPs, promising to be in Ottawa for only a while. That was 20 years ago. On the Conservative front bench, lifers seem to hold many of the important portfolios. Jim Flaherty, Lawrence Cannon, John Baird, Tony Clement, Vic Taves, Rob Nicholson, Peter McKay, and Stockwell Day. The lifer syndrome is apparent on the back benches of every party. Now, some of those are, I'm not sure I agree with all of those. Jim Flaherty came to public life, I think, in his 40s, not in his 20s, but anyway. How do you explain the disconnect between what the MPs told you in their interviews, uh, which is, you know, th th this isn't something I've thought about my whole life. I'm coming to this kind of later in the game. And the very widely held perception that Ottawa is filled with a bunch of people who've been in there since they were 10 years old. I think that uh, excerpt you just read from that column is, is a wonderful example of how deeply misconceptions about politics run through our country. I mean, we got into this originally um, because of a belief in the importance of understanding our politics and how they actually work. And, and in fact, I think this illustrates that uh, that's, we don't always do. We don't always uh, understand it as well as we could. So, um, for example, the the average tenure of a member of parliament is about seven and a half years right now. So far from lifers, the average age of entry is late 40s. So almost all of them spend a generation doing something else. That said, in every house there are people who have you know had politics in their lives from a very young age, mm -hmm. um, and he probably listed 10 of them out of the 308 MPs who do fall into that category. So there certainly are some for which that's that is the chosen career, and that's terrific. But that's uh, more the exception than the rule. I think um, we have a house of. Uh, you know, it's been long called a house of amateurs in the sense that we don't have a professional political class. Well, it is called the House of Commons. They're exactly. supposed to be average people from exactly. every different walk of life. Your report speculates that maybe politicians portray themselves as outsiders and not ambitious. And we kind of got into this by accident and somebody maybe asked me to do it. And that's the first time I thought about it. Because it is somehow, and you touched on this, unseemly to be seen as overly politically ambitious in this country. Mm -hmm. Why is that? It's a wonderful question. It's something that had never occurred to me uh, before until I actually reflected on, on some of these results. Um, but I think you know, it just speaks to the wider uh, reason why we began this in the first place, which is the disconnect between I think, citizens and, and politics. Um, I mean, this has been well documented, but in most industries, you would never uh, criticize your competitors, right? Because it, it brings a, a discolor to the entire industry, but in politics, for good reason, because there's a good jostling about ideas that will always happen. Um, you know, the first inclination is always to, to cut down the profession and cut down those who are in, in your quote unquote industry. Uh, so it's, it's a different dynamic there at play for sure. Um, but I, I, could, I just couldn't help, uh, I couldn't think of another single industry where you would discourage people from acknowledging that it's something that you wanted to do. You know, I was speaking to some some high school teachers this summer and I said could you imagine if if you said to your students you know it's unacceptable to admit that you might want to be a teacher when you grow up you know we wouldn't <laughs> permit that but somehow in politics we've let that happen um, so you know why that is I don't know um, I but a feeling I, it's not because I know we're going through a tea party right now and everybody uh, you know it's very fashionable to hate politics on both sides of the border but this goes back even before the tea party this goes back generations it's unseemly to be seen to being too ambitious in public, I remember talking to Bill Davis about this once. I said, what's mm. it like to have power? And he said, oh, I never exercised power. I thought of myself as providing public service. Mm -hmm. The word power wasn't even in his vocabulary. There's a lot of that still goes on, isn't there? I mean, it appears from these exit interviews that that is the case. Hmm. Um, um, but you know, another, I mean, another thought on that, one of the, uh, you know, the other motivations that really drew a lot of people in was the fact that they had been very involved in their communities in some way. And they'd been in the, what we call the public square in their own worlds. 
And usually one of two things happened from that. Uh, one was that they actually saw you could get things done uh, through working together and working in your community. And some people got jazzed by that, motivated by that. Um, on the flip side, some people saw just terrible things that were happening that weren't being addressed. And they said, you know, we've got to do something about this. So uh, it's, a, it's an odd paradox in a way that um, it's those who've actually experienced, you know, arguably the best of small P, small P politics that mm -hmm. decide to then pursue big P, P politics, but then, you know, seem to somehow want to explain that away when they're asked about it after the fact. So well, one of the most, as long as we're talking about unseemly things, I think one of the most unseemly things about uh, big P politics is often how these folks get nominated to represent their parties and then run for parliament in the first place. And, I mean, we've all heard the stories about these, you know, Brian Mulroney emptying the, uh, the wards of the mental hospitals in 1983 to run for leader of the Federal Conservative Party, this kind of thing. Mm. Why is the nominating process so scuzzy? Well, one of the, this, well, this was something that, that struck us when we were interviewing folks was just how much they disliked the nominations process. Uh, you know, people who said it was the worst political experience of my life. Um, in the report, we called it a black box um, because it's confusing, um, even to those who won. So why is that? I think part of it is a byproduct of being unprepared. Um, you know, people who, even if they might have thought about it subconsciously, weren't actively, you know, planning it. Um, part of it is, uh, you know, part of it is the result of the fact that we have 308 ridings, um, and some are more organized than others. Mm -hmm. um, and for some, the rules are known more than others. Um, so there's just, it's a, it's a broad, spread out country, and that can be hard to organize. Um, but the opportunity I think we're missing uh, in not talking more about the nominations process is really thinking about that riding association as a much more active link between citizens and government. I, I struggle to think of any organization in this country, except for maybe you know the phone company that reaches every nook and cranny of the country. Um, but our political parties, or many of them, actually do in the sense that there's there's an organization there that nominates people. So what if we thought of that as a you know a way of actually trying to uh, increase civic engagement on the ground and create a much more active link between between citizens um, and their government in an ongoing way and not just kind of cobbling together a, mm -hmm. a process every four, four years or two years depending on, on how frequently we have our this, elections. What I'm about to say will be a vast uh, overgeneralization, but humor Go me here for, for a second. Yeah, <laughs> I mean it used to be in the old days that 20 you know, big shots in the riding would get together and they'd go into a church basement and they'd say, okay, you're our candidate and that was it. Now that wasn't very democratic at all, although we got some pretty good people into public life doing it that way. Nowadays, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it seems to be very wrapped up in ethnic politics a lot of the time, whereby you know, you're going to sign up 2,000 Sikhs who are going to come out, or 2,000 Chinese Canadians, or whatever, and uh, you know, they'll bust them all to uh, the, the hockey arena where the nominating meeting is going to take place. They'll vote, and then that's the sum total of their contact with that political party. I mean, is that, I know more people are involved that way, but is that really better? I mean, that's the point. I think we're missing a huge opportunity for a much more active um, engagement between politi politicians and politics and communities. Um, you know, if you're asked to, you know, vote once every four years and you're bussed in from somewhere and that's all you're asked to participate, I mean, it's no wonder people are disengaged. Um, and so I think, you know, really that's the, the opportunity that we have. Um, you know, the nominations process is one part of that, but, uh, of course, and there's rules that have to be followed properly, but, um, but you know, there's... Which sometimes even are. And sometimes they are, <laughs> uh, but they're not well known. It's no. very confusing to those who won the process. So never mind, you know, just a citizen who wants to participate or somebody who lost. I hate to think what they might say if we interviewed them. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be, you know, just a, I think a wonderful opportunity if our political parties wanted to uh, expose it to um, to try to re-engage uh, Canadians with their politics on the ground in the communities where they live. Mm. And just finally, uh, the exit interview process continues. I gather they're going to roll out something else. What? How long down the road, and what's coming next? Yeah. Well, we did. Uh, we did the six, we interviewed the 65 for, former parliamentarians. So the Exxonal Citizen is our first report, and there'll be a, a whole series of them over the course of the next year. Um, so the next one is going to be on how MPs think about their roles and how they spend their time. Um, we'll also have a variety that talk about things like how do, how do they view minority government? How do they feel about question period? How do, they, how do MPs participate in the policy process through committees? Um, and then the last one will be on their reflections, their advice, and their recommendations on how we can strengthen our democracy. Um, so we at Samara are obviously very excited about communicating those more widely to the public and also uh, you know, working hopefully with the education system to talk uh, more widely to people to help increase the understanding of how our politics work, uh, what's working well, so we can talk about that as well as what constructively could be improved. So um, well, stay tuned. Th the House is back just this week and I are, yeah. hope there are uh, at least 308 people who are viewing this interview tonight who may have um, extra reasons to pay attention. Yeah, Allison, so. it's good of you to join us. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you very much for having me. Not at all. Up next on the debate, what does a politician do after his or her career ends? Please stay with us.